the consultant nephrologist and physician working with Africa Healthcare Network in Tanzania. So we, are, we do apologize for the delay. There was technical issues. So there was a delay in, in joining uh, by, by our presenter. So today, uh, today's topic is steroid sensitive nephrotic syndrome. Uh, and we are going to review uh, the guidelines update. And it's a great honor to introduce to you Dr. Professor Rahendra Bima, uh, who is a and who has an ISN fellowship in nephrology, Sick Kids Hospital, Toronto, Canada, and certificate in pediatric nephrology, CMSA. He's also a professor, associate professor of pediatrics, University of KwaZulu-Natal, and principal specialist and specialist pediatric nephrologist in Corsi, Albert Lithul Central Hospital, and King Edward's uh, eight hospital, KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. He's a country a deputy chair of the Biomedical Research Ethics Committee of the University of KwaZulu-Natal. Professor Bima, you are warmly welcome. But before that, I would like to remind uh, those participants from Tanzania to fill in the Google Forms at the end of this presentation uh, or this webinar so that you know, we can submit them to the Tanganyika Medical Council. Uh, for CPD provisions, so CPD awards. So, uh, Professor Bima, are you ready? You are, you are welcome. I, I am. Start. I am. Thanks, Jana. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to apologize profusely for that time delay. This uh, um, Zoom, I've done it many times, but for some reason, I'm having a challenge today. I'm, I'm just going to start sharing my screen, and I'm putting in presenter view. Uh, so, tell me, can you see that, uh, Jana? Yes, yes, yeah. you can see Great. clear. Yeah, very okay. clear. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, like Ajana said, I'm going to speak about steroid sensitive nephrotic syndrome. And one would say this is quite a simple topic, uh, but it isn't. Okay. And what I'm going to do is give you some of the clinical practice recommendations that are about to come out. Now, please, some of this information that I'm going to share with you may, is still not in the public domain. So, therefore, I have not sort of um, referenced it. But I'd like to share it with you. I was hoping the publication comes out because they said to me they will come out in the beginning of May. And therefore I said, Lloyd put the presentation around about the latter part of May, but unfortunately there were delays and therefore it's not out. So as I said, my disclosure is that some of this information is not in the public domain. It might change very, very slightly, but I don't think so because the committee that sat on this, <clears throat> on this panel was quite an august committee and I was fortunate to be one of the panel members. So before I start, I'll just give you a case and I'm gonna come back to this case because then we're gonna look for what are the possible flaws that this pediatrician had made in treating this patient. The case is one of a five-year-old Indian male child, KN, whose weight is 19 kilograms. And he was referred to us by a pediatrician in private practice for a problem of frequently relapsing nephrotic syndrome. And the pediatrician noted that he had three relapses in an 18 month period and therefore send the child over to us because of financial problems to the public hospital for a kidney biopsy. The child had presented to him with periorbital and pedal edema with some ascites. And so it was a typical nephrotic. Blood pressure was normal, corrected for age, sex and height. And the urine dipsticks, when we saw the child, so was uh, having a pH of 5.5, specific gravity of 120. There was no blood in the urine and two plus proteinuria. The rest of the systemic examination was normal and the patient had been commenced on steroids. He was at the time of presentation on 20 milligrams of prednisone. This was given daily. But initially, he, the note was made that he had been treated with prednisone, two milligrams per kilogram with the 40 milligrams given daily for two weeks. The pediatrician had assessed him and because he was in remission, he started to reduce the dose by five milligrams every week. But this was given on a daily basis. And the regimen, as I said, was followed for the two previous relapses with good success. But on this time, the child was not responding as expected. And therefore, um, he was worried that this child was having frequent relapses or was becoming steroid resistant. At the time of presentation, the child had already been uh, on four weeks of treatment. And as I said, he, won 20, he was given 20 milligrams of prednisone daily. Now, I want you to keep this case 
in mind because I'm going to come back to it after the presentation so that you are familiar with what's going on. And then we'll look for what are the possible faults that we see in this presentation, in this, in, in, in the, in the management of this child. So if you look at nephrotic syndrome, <clears throat> it is one of the most frequent glomerular disorders in childhood. And if you look at it across the board, whether it's steroid sensitive or steroid resistant, you get about two to seven cases per 100,000 children per year globally, with a prevalence of approximately 16 cases per 100,000. Now that figure, if you translate it, doesn't look like a lot. But of course, if you're working in a tertiary hospital where you are collecting all the patients, you'll find that in your ward at any one time, you are bound to have at least two to three nephrotics that are being admitted. And being a referral center, we, we are often seeing these kind of patients who are much more complicated than those usual uh, just plain steroid sensitive nephrotics. Ste steroids, of course, are the mainstay of initial treatment. And of course, the classification on a clinical basis is based upon steroid sensitivity. Now, depending on racial disparities, about 85 to 90% of patients attain complete remission within four to six weeks of steroid therapy. Why did I say racial disparities? And I discussed this in a previous talk is because some of our, of our, of our indigenous uh, black African patients do not respond to steroids as well as what you would see in other racial groups. So in that scenario, we have between a, about a 40 to 60% response rate, not as good as what is given in the global figures. So if you look at, a steroid sensitive patient with primary nephrotic syndrome, about 85 to 90%, as I said, respond within the first four to six weeks. The remainder, of course, become uh, diagnosed steroid resistant if they fail to respond initially. 50% of those patients who are responsive will then have at least one relapse on follow up. Of that remaining 50%, they will go on to develop either frequently relapsing nephrotic syndrome or steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome. They're still steroid sensitive, but they develop this more complicated form of steroid sensitive disease. So what I took the liberty of doing is I copied this directly from the um, guideline book to highlight to you what are the definitions now that are going to come across to you with regards to steroid sensitive nephrotic syndrome. And what I did, I highlight the one specifically which pertain to this category of patients. So how does the IPNA defines steroid sensitivity. They say there must be complete remission within four weeks of prednisone therapy at standard doses. Now, what is defined as standard dose? And this is where the discrepancy comes about. In some units, they use it as 60 milligram per meter squared per day. That means based on the square uh, meterage of the child. Whereas in other units, they use it per kilogram. Now, two milligram per kilogram per day with a maximum of 60 milligrams. And that's where we defer from what I think those that treat adults do, I think adults go up to 80 milligrams, right? So this is what we use in children. And when I say children, in this case, we are referring to children less than 14 years of age, okay? We're not talking about the older adolescent group, right? So that's the standard kind of definition of steroid sensitive nephrotic syndrome. However, as we made note, there are some patients, particularly in our population, our indigenous black population, who don't respond by the four weeks, but if you continue the steroids for a little longer, they tend to respond. So we put in another definition, which is called the confirmation period. So what is a confirmation period? It is the time period between four and six weeks from initiation of prednisone, during which responses to further oral prednisone or pulses of intravenous methylprednisolone and the use of, uh, of a renin angiotensin aldosterone uh, system inhibitor are, are used to get this patient into remission. So if the patient after that period is achieving only a partial remission, then by definition, they become steroid resistant. If however, the patient responds by the six week period with either giving three doses of intravenous methylprednisolone or continuing the steroids at that same dose for six weeks and together with the addition of a RAS inhibitor, then they are by definition steroid sensitive. So that's a slight variation from what the standard definition is, as you will see in the older KTGO guideline. And they put in another rider to this, and it gets more complicated with these definitions. They now define a category of patients who are said to be 
steroid sensitive nephrotics, but late responders. So what are these late responders? These are patients who achieve complete remission during the confirmation period. So what's the confirmation period? As I said, it's between four to six weeks, right? So if they do that, then they are said to be late responders. So as long as they go into complete remission, they are still categorized as steroid sensitive, right? It's not like the old ISKDC definition where they said four weeks of steroid. If you don't respond, you're steroid resistant. So we've got a leeway of this two weeks. So as I said to you, of all 50% of those patients who respond will have at least one relapse. And of the remaining 50%, they will go on to develop either frequent relapsing or steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome. So let's take the first 50%. That means those patients who have what we call infrequent relapsing nephrotic syndrome, right? They, by definition, have less than two relapses in a six month period. And this is followed by uh, remission of the, that after the initial episode, or they have fewer than three relapses in any subsequent 12 month period. Okay, so that's a very important definition. It has to be within the 12 month period that they must have less than three relapses. If they have, on the other hand, frequent relapsing nephrotic syndrome, then they have more than two relapses in the first six months. And this is following remission of the initial episode, or they have more than three relapses, three or more relapses in any 12 month period, okay? So that's the key thing we have to make a note of that it must be within that period of time. If on the other hand, you have a patient who is steroid sensitive, but who experiences two consecutive relapses during the recommended prednisone therapy, uh, then if they relapse on the tailing dose or within 14 days of the discontinuation of steroids, they are on two or more occasions then they are defined as having steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome. So if you start reducing steroids and the patient relapses, put bump the steroids to, to the full dose. And once again, you start reducing and the patient relapses again when you come to these reducing doses or within 14 days of cessation of steroid therapy, then they are defined as steroid dependent. Now, this definition is in slight conflict with what the recommendation is, and I'll bring it to you to your attention a little later. So those are the, the I copied this directly from the, from, the, from the guideline book. So that's the definition we have. Now, many people then went on to look at what happens subsequently. So they say that if you follow the patient up and the patient has sustained remission, now what is defined as sustained remission? That means there's no relapses over a 12 month period with or without therapy. Now, this way it becomes confusing because you say that how can the patient have sustained remission but he's still on treatment? But the difference is that many patients who have steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome are maintained on low doses of prednisone to prevent subsequent relapse. So the committee decided that given the fact that these patients are still not relapsing, that means they're not developing massive protein urea or edema or anything, we will keep that category of what is called sustained remission with or without therapy. The next category is steroid sensitive nephrotic syndrome controlled on therapy. That means these patients have either infrequently relapsing nephrotic syndrome or sustained remission while on immunosuppression in the absence of any significant drug toxicity. So this definition came about because there are patients who have nephrotic syndrome who may not just respond to steroids, even if they're steroid dependent, but you have to add a second line agent. And we'll discuss what those second line agents are sub subsequently in the later in the talk. But as long as they are maintaining remission, right, they are defined as being controlled on therapy. Then you have the next category, which is steroid sensitive, not controlled on therapy. And of course, this is the direct opposite of what I just said. That means they either have frequent relapsing nephrotic syndrome despite immunosuppression or significant drug related toxicity while on immunosuppression. The next category is secondary steroid resistance. And this category is defined as steroid sensitive nephrotic syndrome patients who at a subsequent relapse do not achieve complete remission after four weeks of prednisone therapy given standard doses. And I defined for you what standard doses were, either 60 milligrams per meter squared per day or two milligrams per kilogram. So that's defined as secondary steroid resistance. And then you get a last category, which is complicated relapse, where there's a relapse requiring hospitalization due to one or more of the following. And what is this, these conditions? They have very severe edema, 
And what is defined as severe edema? It's either whole body swelling with anasaka, and usually if the patient has, if the patient is ambulant and has genital edema, that's sufficient to make the definition of severe edema. If they have symptomatic hypovolemia, or they have acute kidney injury requiring intravenous albumin infusions. If they develop complications like thrombosis or severe infections like severe peritonitis, a cellulitis or a pneumonia or something like that, those are defined as complicated relapses. So I must say then that when you look at the new guidelines, this you have to sit down and really digest these things. But once you go through it, you will realize why this was put into the guidelines. So that when you are talking about steroid sensitive nephrotics, it's just not saying that, okay, fine, the patient's done. You have to then subcategorize them into each one of these, 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 these uh, definitions. And once you do that, then you'll know exactly the type of patient that you are referring or the type of patient that you are dealing with. Okay, so does anyone have any questions to, regarding those things? Now, these definitions haven't yet been uh, sort of um, uh, put into the public domain, but this is what the committee thought would be uh, ideal way to, to define all the subcategories of steroid sensitive nephrotic. So having finished the definitions, what's the pathogenesis? And I really, this is a guideline talk, so I didn't want to go into the details of pathogenesis, but just to tell you what impacts on the guidelines is that we still don't know what's the exact etiology of steroid sensitive nephrotics, but we do know that it's an immune-mediated disease and that there is clinical heterogeneity, which suggests that different mechanisms might be involved. And like I said, it is immune-mediated, so there is immunological dysfunction of both T cells and B cells that are carried, right? And you get relapses after um, rituximab. And because of this, and we know what rituximab is, it is a CD20 monoclonal antibody. And this is linked to the reappearance of memory B cells. So that is why these patients relapse, right? You monitor the CD20 and CD19 B cells, and you notice that once you get a resurgence of these cells, the patient tends to relapse. So you have to repeat the dose of rituximab. So what does this imply? This suggests that there's a specific role of this sub subpopulation of lymphocytes in the pathogenesis of this disease. Okay, so I think I'm going to leave pathogenesis there because, like I said, this was a talk mainly on the new guidelines and not just on steroid sensitive nephrotics. But just to tell you that this is something that is now new in the pathogenesis of this condition, besides the HLAs and other genes. Now, during my talk, you're going to come across level A, level B, level C, level D, or level X. And this is an extrapolation of the guidelines used to grade the various studies that are done. And it's based on the AAT definition, the American Academy of Pediatrics definition. So I'm not going to go into it in detail because it's not a detailed uh, uh, lecture on, on, on uh, research methodology, but to tell you that level A is where you got intervention that is well-defined and conducted trials with meta-analysis on the applicable population. And the diagnosis is an independent group the gold standard of studies with applicable populations. So there you have well-defined studies which are randomized uh, studies which um, have either meta-analyses and the, the aims and, and, the, and, this, and the outcomes and what we call the <coughs> criteria that you use your primary aim and the secondary aims are well-defined. Level B studies are trials or diagnostic studies with just some limitations. So that means if you're taking nephrotics and you say, well, I'm going to study a group of nephrotics, some may be minimal change, some may be FSG, some. So there are some limitations to it. But as long as you are serosensitive, sensitive, I am going to look at the genetics of this, right? So you're not looking specifically at minimal change disease and the genetics of that, but you're looking at something with some minor limitations given the fact that the histology varies. But as long as you have consistent findings with multiple observations, that is categorized as level B. So that's Level B will then become a moderate recommendation by the committee. Level C, on the other hand, is single or few just observational studies or multiple studies with inconsistent findings or major limitations, while level D is purely expert opinion. If you say, I've been treating nephrotics for many years, and you write an opinion piece, or you write an, uh, 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 what do you call it, um, <clears throat> monogram or something, and you say, this is my experience in nephrotics, it's just an opinion, okay? It's not based upon randomized control trials, or you have case reports, 
or reasoning from first principles, right? So that becomes a very weak recommendation, okay? Right? If you say that I tend to use steroids which are at the dose of 30 milligrams uh, per meter squared per day instead of 60 milligrams per meter squared per day and I have equally good outcome, it's your observation. It's not, it's an expert opinion. It's not based on randomized control trial. So that's the level D. The level X on the other hand is exceptional situations where validating studies cannot be performed and or the benefit or harm is clearly predominates. So now <clears throat> this is a different category where if you say that I am going to do a study, but I'm going to do a placebo control trial. Now you cannot do that in this day and age, okay? You're not allowed, you have to test it against a, 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 a well-established treatment for that particular condition. So this is divided into either moderate or strong recommendation where you, sometimes you just cannot do a particular study for some, 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 from some reason because the benefits of the therapy far outweigh the risk of the treatment, okay? So that would be a strong recommendation where on the other hand, there's the, 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 the drug has some side effects, but the benefits are still much better. That'll be a moderate recommendation. So I just spent some time going on to this because when you see that in, my, in the rest of my presentation, you will understand what level A, level B or level D or X means. So how do we go about diagnosing and managing nephrotics? This is a classical thing that we do both in pediatrics and in uh, adult nephrology. But in pediatrics, we pay particular attention, particular attention to the, um, what do you call it, anthropometric measurements to the vaccine status and the family history of, of, of our patients. So as long as we do that, we, we will be, okay, here we go, right. So <clears throat> we pay particular attention to that because in childhood, we are particularly interested in preventing, in vaccinating these patients and preventing things like pneumococcal peritonitis, et cetera, which are quite common. But fortunately with the advent of uh, pneumococcal vaccine, I don't know how many countries are giving it, but in South Africa, it is part of the expanded program for immunization. Nowadays, I'm very, 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 I haven't seen a nephrotic with, with pneumococcal peritonitis, I think for the last 10 years, okay? When the vaccine came about. And then family history, we particularly pay attention to because of the fact that we know that if there is a family history of the disease, if there's consanguinity or any extra renal manifestations, then these patients are more likely to have a genetic form of the nephrotic syndrome as opposed to patients where it is purely uh, given and on a random basis. And of course, we have a high incidence on TB and HIV. So in these areas, it is very important for you to exclude this before you start immunosuppression or you to start it simultaneously with treatment. The biochemistry is particularly very much the same as you do in adults, but the one difference is that when you're looking at urine to quantify proteinuria, in adults it's easy, in the older child it's also fine, where you can do 24-hour urine collections, but of course in young children we have a problem because it's very difficult to collect 24-hour urines for them, so we rely predominantly on the protein creatinine ratio. Okay, and the rest of the workup is pretty much the same like what you do in adults. So I'm not going to spend too much of time of that as it is a lot of time on <clears throat> trying to get this technical detail sort of. Kidney ultrasound. This, this is a question I often get asked. Every nephrotic, must I do an ultrasound in or not? My own view is that if it's the initial presentation, we should do it if ultrasound is available. And why is that important is because you can pick up any cacat, in other words, congenital abnormalities of the kidney and urinary tract, right? But ultrasound is particularly indicated if you're thinking of renal malformations or if you're thinking of thrombosis, especially if the patient has a reduced uh, estimated GFR or the patient presented with abdominal pain, or if, you, if it's a steroid-resistant nephrotic and you're gonna biopsy the patient, of course, in that case, it will ultrasound directed biopsies. So that is pretty much standard for us that all patients who are coming initially will have an ultrasound done. See, what about kidney biopsy? We and in our unit do not biopsy patients who remain steroid sensitive, okay? Because of the fact that histology plays less of a role in our treatment. But you should consider it if the patients are presenting with either congenital nephrotic syndrome or infantile nephrotic syndrome in the pediatric age group. Of course, all patients who have steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome will get biopsied. 
And you should consider in patients where you have persistent microscopic hematuria in, in populations where the high incidence of glomerular disease such as IgA nephropathy. And this is something that our colleagues from Southeast Asia brought up because of the high incidence of IgA nephropathy. So they will biopsy these patients, right? Also, if you consider it in patients who are greater than 12 years of age, uh, and that is done on a case-by-case -case basis. Once again, you can see it's a weak recommendation, okay? Why? Because the most important prognostic indicator of outcome in nephrotics is steroid sensitivity. It is not the histology, it is not the genetics, it's not anything else. As long as the patient is steroid sensitive, the chances of them having progression to, to uh, chronic kidney failure is very little. So those are the indications for biopsy. And you can see that <clears throat> of these, the only ones that fit into this category that we biopsy are the steroid dependent and frequently relapsing nephrotic. Like I said, steroids are the mainstay of treatment uh, for this patient. It's first line therapy and that's those given, right? The new recommendation now is that if you start steroids, right? You should, for every lapse, you should treat with a single dose of prednisone two milligrams per kilogram per day or 60 milligrams per meter squared per day with a maximum of 60 milligrams until you get com complete remission and then decrease to alternate day prednisone. And when you go to alternate day prednisone, you drop the dose to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram per dose or 40 milligrams per meter squared per dose with a maximum of 40 milligrams for four weeks. Now, <clears throat> there's been a lot of debate about this. And there's been studies from India and studies from various other populations looking at minimizing steroids or giving uh, longer courses to prevent subsequent relapses, et cetera. But none of the studies have so far shown, have so far shown any great merit. And so for, because of the, some of the limitations based on the studies, the committee decided this would be a grade B recommendation, okay? Because of some of the limitations. What is different and I am, was a little adverse to accepting this is that the committee does not recommend a tapering dose of steroids during alternate day dosaging. I don't know how many of you do this, but I still taper the doses of steroids even when I follow this regimen. I follow it slightly differently because as I said, in our black patients, we have a slightly muted response to steroids. So I give two milligrams per kilogram, maximum 60 milligrams for six weeks, and then give the same alternate day doses for six weeks and begin tailing off. And in that way, we've diagnosed a lot of steroid sensitive nephrotics, okay? Even in our black population. However, if we follow this regimen and I've tried it, then we're getting many patients who do not go into remission. So I am worried that if you start not taping off the steroids, you might get steroid withdrawal symptoms, okay? And renal insufficiency. What's the problem with this? failure to withdraw is that you get hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis suppression with the steroids. The committee found that based on literature, the view there was no relevant data available on the duration, frequency, and complications of transient adrenal insufficiency in childhood nephrotics. So they did a literature search and, and the person who was presenting it said there was not sufficient data to show that if you don't tell off steroids, you're going to get adrenal insufficiency. Clinically apparent transient adrenal resources seems to be a very rare event. Now, what was this based on? It was based on a single study, right? And in this study, it was suspected in 775 patients that only one child, right, had steroids who are said to have nephrotic syndrome when they looked at it, uh, developed a headache and, sp and spontaneous improvement thereafter and had some evidence of this. Three of the other studies did not show any evidence. So, so based on those four randomized control studies, the recommendation was made that you do not have to tail off steroids. And we can discuss this later. So the committee have a, gave you a little window of opportunity to say that if you have risk factors for glucocorticoid induced adrenal insufficiency, then you should consider not stopping abruptly, but tailing off steroids. What are these the factors? They are daily steroid therapy for more than a few weeks, and they didn't define what is four weeks, but according to the literature, it is more than four weeks. Evening or bedtime doses for more than a few weeks. So that means if you're splitting the dose of steroids and any patient who has a Cushingoid appearance, right? That means they're having thoracic toxicity or also nephrotic syndrome diagnosed before five years of age and steroid dependency, 
in that category of patients, if you're using high dose steroids and you are then going on to alternate days, you should consider tailing off your treatment rather than abruptly stopping. Children receiving daily prednisone therapy for fewer than three weeks or alternate day prednisone therapy are less likely to present with adrenal insufficiency. I agree with the statement, but as I said, if you are using higher doses, even on alternate days, I will be a little, I'll be very reluctant not to tailor off my treatment with the use of steroids. Now, what about the use of steroids during infections? And this is another question that you often uh, get thrown at us to say, I have a child who's got nephrotic syndrome. He's developed an upper respiratory infection, tract infection. I know that in a week's time, he's going to relapse. So should I just prophylactic to give him steroids to prevent the relapse? Unfortunately, uh, there was a large study done, and I'm going to come to this now. There is not much into the literature show that this is very effective. I must admit that I'm guilty that up to the time that the, this, the Prednos study was uh, published, I used to really practice this. I used to advise the general pediatricians if they phone to say, listen, if the child is on steroids or if the child is a nephrotic who is in remission, has developed an upper respiratory sac infection or came in with a gastroenteritis pneumonia, give him five days of, of, of steroids and stop it. Hopefully, we will not see a risk. It seemed to work. But the literature doesn't bear that out. Uh, they say that you should suggest considering a short course of ladospredinone at the onset of an upper respiratory tract infection in children who are already taking low dose alternate day prednisone or have a history of repeated infection associated relapses. They said it's a very weak recommendation. And what is what based on this? There was a prednos study, which was a randomized controlled trial, and this was generalizable to all. Uh, nephrotics, that means all the uh, steroid-sensitive patients, that were irrespective of what the histology was. There was a low risk of bias, and in this study, they evaluated 271 children with nephrotic syndrome and upper respiratory tract infections. What it was a finding, the study found no benefit of administering five days of low-dose prednisone, 15 milligrams per meter squared body surface area, which is equivalent to about 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, at the onset of an upper respiratory tract infection in preventing relapses. My take on this is that the dose of prednisone that they use was pretty low, and I don't think so you're going to prevent a relapse with that. My own experience, and I haven't published this, is that if you use full dose steroids for five days, you see a really good response. So the finding was consistent among subgroups of children receiving alternative prednisone or children receiving alternative prednisone and other immunosuppressive agents. So based on this data, the committee then recommended that there's no benefit in giving prednisone for a patient who develops an infection to try and prevent a relapse subsequent. What about the dose of steroids? Now, as I said, a prednisone dose of 60 milligrams per meter squared is often considered equivalent to two milligrams per kilogram, right? However, this approximation is actually an underestimate considering that the dose of body surface area in children is small. Recently, there's been a lot of work done of this by one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Martin, and he used a simplified formula that he proposed that you should correct for when you're using steroids by kilogram, by uh, body mass, uh, sorry, rather than meterage. And he said that a dose of two milligram per kilogram plus 10 milligrams was shown to produce a very accurate approximation of the prednisone dose calculated in milligrams per meter squared for doses that do not exceed 60 milligrams. I must say that I haven't put this into practice, but it's something that I'm considering doing. So that means if you've got a child that requires steroids, who is like our patient, 19 kilograms, let's say roughly 20, and you're giving 40 milligrams, you should actually add 10 milligram steroids to it. So then it becomes 50 milligrams. But as I said, I have not put this into practice as yet. I am waiting to see what the rest of the study shows. Now, in many centers, doses are split in two, but this has not found to have any effect on efficacy. And I must say, I also practice this because if you're using tablets and you tell the mom to give 12 tablets of prednisone, she looks at you cross-eyed and say, whoa, is this doctor trying to kill my child or is he trying to poison my child? You know what I mean? So... <clears throat> They don't understand sometimes that each tablet of prednisone is five milligrams and to get 60 milligrams, you have to give 12 tablets. Also, it's quite a bit of tablet for the child to swallow at one go. So sometimes I split the dose to say, okay, give six in the morning or six in the evening or even give it three times a day, right? You give four, four, four. So in that way, it makes it much more palatable for the child to be able to tolerate that dose of prednisone. 
Is there anything we can do to predict relapses of, of steroid sensitive nephrotics? And the answer is no. There's no biological marker that has been identified that would rapidly predict a relapse, right? What we do know is after any infection, whether it be upper respiratory tract infection, gastroenteritis, or anything, if your child is a nephrotic, it's going to be likely to lapse. There was a single study that identified the presence of IgM on the surface of T lymphocytes as a marker of difficult forms of steroid sensitive nephrotic, but this study was never replicated and it is quite a cumbersome study and to put it into clinical practice would be quite an exercise until something simpler is designed. So unfortunately, that was the only study I could find that showed that this could be a predictor of relapses. What we do know, however, from epidemiological studies is that young children tend to have more severe relapses. So the younger the child, the more likely are you to get severe relapse. And a post-hoc analysis of a prospective study suggested that children less than four years may benefit from longer initial causes of prednisone. And I brought this out again, that I, especially not just in children less than four years old, but especially in our indigenous Black African patients, I tend to use high-dose steroids up to six weeks before I start to go to alternatives. And because then they are most likely to respond. They very rarely respond fully by four weeks of steroids. Now, there's an interesting study that's called the RESTED study, that means reducing steroids in relapsing nephrotic syndrome. And this is a double blind randomized control study that's assessing the efficacy and safety of steroids uh, dose for treatment of relapses. Now, this is treatment of relapses, not the initial uh, relapse, or, uh, initial presentation. So unfortunately, I looked at the literature, but the study has not, this was only published in a protocol form and study is ongoing. So we're going to wait for the outcome of this study with a bated breath. Hopefully, if they show that we can use lower doses of steroids to, to treat relapses, and this will not have an in, impact on subsequent relapses, it will be great because of the side effects of steroids. How do you treat relapses? And this is pretty much standard, so I'm not going to spend too much of time on that. Once again, to emphasize that in our pediatric population, we pay particular emphasis on vaccine status and the presence of steroid toxicity, et cetera. So if we find that, then we'll consider either changing to an alter, I mean, using a steroid pairing agent or to biopsying the child. The biochemistry is pretty much the same. The difference, once again, like in the initial presentation is that Whilst in adults, you can do 24-hour urine collections to estimate proteinuria, we tend to use a protein-creatinine ratio, okay? And apart from that, uh, the rest of the treatment is pretty standard. With regards to 25-hydroxyvitamin D, I must say that if you look at this level in the, in the time that the child has left, obviously it's going to be low because they're losing the vitamin b binding protein in the urine. Right? But in, in, when the child goes into remission, I've really, really found steroid I mean, uh, vitamin D deficiency. And that's because, I guess, of our climate. We have uh, sunshine th most throughout the year, particularly in Durban. We have summer and summer. We hardly get winter. Okay, So vitamin D deficiency is not something that we find very commonly. But I think in uh, Western countries, etc., where the weather is very different and they hardly have sunlight, etc., this becomes quite an important entity, right? but not so much so in South Africa, or I'm not sure what happens in the rest of, of, of the uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Kidney ultrasound in relapses, only recommended if you are considering a kidney biopsy. Otherwise, it's no need for doing an ultrasound. Okay, Every time a patient relapses, you don't have to send them for an ultrasound. What kind of patients do we biopsy? We recommend considering a biopsy in patients who are steroid sensitive being follow-up if the findings may potentially influence therapy, that means your steroid frequent relapsing or your steroid dependent patients, or if it's going to help prognosis. So what you're going to say is that, look, if this, you suspect that this child may have features which more likely in keeping with, say, focal segmental glomerulus, because he's got significant hematuria, he has hypertension, and although he's responding to steroids, then you biopsy the patient because if you find FSGS, it suggests that this patient subsequently is going to become steroid resistant. What about genetic testing in steroid sensitive patients? This is recommended in patients who have congenital nephrotic syndrome, like I said, extra renal features, or where there's a strong family history suggesting uh, some type of syndromic or hereditary form of steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome. So if you have genetic testing available, and I don't know how many of you are doing that, we have it available in the private sector in a limited way. 
some of our medical insurances pay for genetic testing, others don't. So depending on the category of medical insurance the patient is on, we will or will not be able to be get reimbursement for that. So I've done it in a few patients and I must say that uh, so far I have not been very lucky uh, in finding mutations, but it's something that is available. Consider in patients who have infantile onset nephrotic syndrome, that means between the ages of three to 12 months. And of course, it's recommended in all patients who are diagnosed with steroid resistant, and that's a grade A. And that's because of the fact that we know that even in sporadic forms of steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome, if they have FSGS, uh, they are likely to have some type of genetic mutation. And we found it in at least 30% of our black African patients. So if we had genetic testing readily available, then we will, in our steroid resistant nephrotics, be able to get away without biopsy in about 30% of cases. And why is it important to do that? Is because we know that these patients will not respond to any other form of immunosuppression that we commonly have available, okay? I haven't tested it in rituximab because as I said, that's not something readily available to us, but for the rest of the steroid sparing agents, these patients have not shown any response to treatment. So we can get away with drug toxicity and prolonged treatment in these patients. And what's the other good thing about finding a mutation is that we know that particularly in FSGS, if we transplant this patient, the chances of them getting a recurrence of the disease in the transplanted kidney is pretty, pretty much rare. So that's the these clinical indications for why genetic testing should be recommended in steroid resistant patients. With regards to steroid sensitive patients, I must say, I haven't been very lucky in finding genetic mutations. So what's the optimal mode approach for children with steroids, uh, frequently relapsing and steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome? You should recommend the use of maintenance treatment in all patients who have this form of steroid sensitive disease. That means they are frequent relapsing or steroid dependent, and that's uh, group B, uh, grade B recommendation, sorry. And in patients with frequently relapsed in nephrotic, nephrotic syndrome, it is recommended using either low dose maintenance prednisone if they are able to tolerate that without toxicity and they remain in remission. Like I said, it's defined as sustained remission if they do not relapse in a 12 month period. And this is given on an alternate day or daily dose, daily dosing, or if they develop any signs of toxicity, then we should introduce a steroid bearing agent. And this is a group A recommendation. So it's based on well-controlled randomized studies. So when do we introduce a steroid bearing agent in the management of steroid sensitive nephrotics? This is recommended if you cannot control the patient on therapy using steroids, patients who suffer complicated relapses, and I defined for you what complicated relapses were, or with patients who have steroid dependent nephrotic symptoms. And this is a grade B recommendations, right? So I think those are quite clearly defined guidelines for when you should consider alternate steroid sparing agents. Which agent you should consider and what are these agents? So the selection of a steroid sparing agent should be made in conjunction with the patient. And when you choose this, you should choose the most appropriate medication for that individual according to their values and preferences. So we do not dictate to patients, uh, particularly uh, uh, if the patients are coming from rural areas, et cetera, that look, you got to use uh, a CNI because you have to come to hospital every two weeks to get your blood taken, okay? So we have to choose an agent where it is suitable for the patient and it is effective. Now, what are the steroid sparing agents that we have in our armamentarium? We have calcineurin inhibitors. And fortunately for us, we have uh, tacrolimus available. We have cyclophosphamide, which we used to use quite commonly, less nowadays. We do not have levimazole, but I think many of you may ha might have it. And I know it's available in South America and a few other countries. And then of course, we have mycophenolate mofetil, but we very rarely use this unless the patient has got compromised kidney function or the patient cannot tolerate any of the other two agents. That means calcineurin inhibitors or cyclophosphamide. Okay. So those are the two most, I mean, four, uh, three most common agents we have. As I said, levimazole is not available to us. If you use um, rituximab as a steroid-pacing agent, this should be only done in 
either frequent relapsing or steroid dependent patients who are not controlled on therapy after a course of treatment with at least one of the other steroid bearing agents. So it is used as rescue treatment rather than as initial. However, I'm, I have to um, tell you that speaking to my colleagues from Europe and some of them from the States, they are now starting to use rituximab as second line treatment as opposed to doing it as a rescue treatment when they don't respond to the other, other groups of steroid bearing agents. And you should use it in an adequate dose, uh, especially if uh, you want to suppress your B cells. And the other indication is, of course, patients who are non-adherent to oral treatment, okay? Uh, especially in the older child, okay, teenage patients, et cetera. If they're non-adherent to oral therapy, this is, of course, given intravenously. So you bring it in a controlled situation in hospital and you will be able to ensure compliance. Switching to a different steroid bearing agent when a patient is not controlled on therapy with the initial agent, this is a great X recommendation, okay? There's no randomized controlled trial to do that, right? If you've got prior toxicity, you obviously have to use a steroid bearing agent. If you have toxicity from, say, CNIs or toxicity from cyclophosphamide, obviously you're going to change to, to another agent. Nobody's going to do a trial on that. So therefore, it's a grade X where there's no studies, but it's a strong recommendation. So that's a classical example of grade X. Tapril and discontinuation of maintenance treatment in all children in sustained remission for at least 12 months. So when should you stop considering you, uh, stop using this steroid bearing agents? And I said, if they have sustained remission for at least a 12 month period. After that, you can either tail it off or abruptly stop it. There is no recommendation on that, right? Most of us just abruptly stop it. And then we watch the patient and see if they're going to relapse. Of course, if they do relapse again, then we put them onto a longer course. I actually aim for two years rather than for 12 months. These are the agents that I spoke about and the particular dosages. I'm not going to run through it in any detail because of time constraint, but just to tell you that when you're using any of these agents, you have to ensure that the patient is properly um, immunized, that you check your full blood count to make sure that many of these agents drop the white cell count, et cetera. So you have to ensure that they have um, adequate immunity, they are fully vaccinated, and that you should not try and use these agents at, during the time of infection or anything. If you find the child develop a severe infection, then you should stop the agent and then reintroduce it at a later stage. What are the other steroid sparing agents which are not recommended? And this is by the committee. Uh, Mizoribine, I've never used it and I don't have any experience with it. We definitely do not use uh, azithromycin and we also do not use azathioprine, right? Azathioprine is quite a toxic agent and so we do not use it. I don't know if the oncologists are still using it or not. And there's been some trials being done on ACTH, adenocorticotropic hormone, and there's been some literature to show that it's quite effective, but these studies are small uh, studies, case, case studies, and therefore the committee decided they would not recommend this as a steroid bearing agent. And this was given a grade B uh, recommendation because of the fact that there's no proper randomized control. So after all that work that was done, we decided that we'll simplify everything and come up with an algorithm or treatment of this group of patients. So what are the group of patients with steroid sensitive nephrotic syndrome we have? We have on the left-hand side, here we have infrequently relapsing nephrotic syndrome. Then we have a group which are frequently relapsing nephrotics. And then we have a group that are steroid dependent nephrotics. Okay. The initial management is pretty much easy. You start off with steroids and you only consider alternate agents if I told you they develop toxicity or they're not responding, etc. Right. Now you reevaluate re the patient every six months. And after 12 months, if they sustain remission, you should consider taping off the maintenance dose of prednisone and then stop. Okay. If you maintain them on low dose steroids on alternate days or daily, and after 12 months, they haven't had any relapses, you should stop. For the frequently relapsing nephrotics, if they are not controlled on therapy, that means they, they have uh, no, if, uh, sorry, if or if they have complicated relapses, then you should consider introducing a steroid bathing agent. So this, this is a more complicated group of nephrotics that you see. So here you should consider using a steroid bearing agent. In a steroid dependent one, of course, definitely if they're relapsing at a high dose of steroids, 
you will consider using a steroid bearing agent. So what are the steroid bearing agents? We use calcium urine inhibitors as our first line. Previously, we used to use cyclophosphamide and only, like I said, if the patient has any evidence of compromised kidney function or hypertension, something will be considered using mycophenolate because this is much more expensive. And you should discuss the optimal approach for each individual with the families and parents based on the risk and benefits of each of the available therapeutic agents. So it's very important to explain to the, to the parents what the agent you are going to consider using, why you're considering using it. And of course, very importantly, what are the adverse effects because you don't want to be taken to court. Right? Then you monitor the patient every three to six months and reevaluate the patients again at six to 12 months. If the patient is controlled on therapy for more than 12 months, of course, you can consider uh, tapering or discontinuing the immunosuppression. If the patient is on multiple treatments, you should prioritize this based on toxicity. That means you should consider which is the most toxic agent that you have. Is it prednisone or is it uh, cyclophosphamide or whatever? And I mean, uh, mycophenolate or CNI, therefore you should tail that off, right? If the patient is not controlled on therapy, you can substitute a steroid patient agent with a second choice, or you can go on to use of rituximab. Right? So even here in our algorithm, we put in rituximab as a rescue treatment for these patients rather than as second line treatment. However, if the patient remains not uncontrolled on treatment, then you should consider enrollment in an available clinical trial, or you should use a combination of steroid patients. So that means you have a group of patients who respond to steroids, you start them on a CNI, etc., but you're finding they are not, after a while they are not responding, then you can do one of two things. You can either swap the second line agent for another agent, or you can add another agent to the treatment. But I think in this category, most of these patients here will develop steroid resistant nephrotic. So they'll get biopsies and treated appropriately. So that's an, as a kind of algorithm that was designed by the working group to, sh to show you how to manage this group of difficult patients. So these are the frequent relapsing and steroid resistant nephrotics. The infrequent relapsing ones are pretty much straightforward, okay? So what we can say in conclusion is that the overall management, including how to monitor and manage the relapses, how to modify maintenance therapy must be discussed with parents, right? That's very, very important, okay? It's, uh, important that the parent understands what these agents are, what the side effects are, etc., and so forth. They may be prepared for it so that in the effect, in the event, sorry, that they do experience any of these side effects, they can bring it to your attention and you can discontinue treatment. Tapering of immunosuppressed therapy should be tried at least every two years. Okay, now they're saying here every two years and initially it's a 12 months, but I keep them on maintenance therapy in my unit for at least two years before I will consider stopping treatment. And it's important that a patient with steroid on, uh, childhood onset steroid resist, sensitive nephrotic syndrome, transition to adult care must take place when he or her medical condition is stable and the patient and caregivers are prepared for the transition. This is a problem that we commonly encounter. We don't have a transition clinic, okay? So <clears throat> that's because of staffing constraints, et cetera. And when we send these patients over to the adult unit, my colleague always complained that you are sending our patients which are very difficult because all of them tend to relax. I told him, no, they were quite stable when we saw them, okay? And that's because when you go into this transition, many of these patients are not prepared, to, uh, prepared for that. And then what happens is they either stop taking medication or they feel that now that they're in the adult unit, they should be managed differently. So what happens is you get relapses. But if the patient is properly counseled and properly transitioned, I think uh, the, our adult colleagues would say that these patients have been reasonably well managed and will have sustained remission. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna stop there. Um, I apologize once again for starting late. I know it's a bit of extra time, but um, I'll come back to the first uh, slide that I have. And now that I've given you the talk, I'll show you what were the problems with that. So, Sorry, this is what our patient was, a five-year-old with steroid sensitive nephrotic who was by the pediatrician diagnosed as having frequent relapse in nephrotic syndrome. What's the problem here? The problem is that he counted the relapses as three, but these relapses were over an 18-month period, not a 12-month period. So this child still does not qualify as being a frequently relapsing nephrotic syndrome. Okay, so that's the first problem. Second problem was 
the dose of prednisone that was given initially was a pretty low dose, okay? It wasn't even close to two milligrams per kilogram initially, but he gave 40 milligrams for two weeks and then he just tailed it off. He stopped, stopped that and went on to reducing in a peculiar way, five milligrams every week, okay? I don't know where he got that from, but this was what was used. And fortunately, this child was quite steroid sensitive initially, so the child responded for the first relapse and the initial uh, presentation, but subsequently the child failed to respond. And the other problem is that if you look at this uh, patient, when he came to us, et cetera, he also had mild evidence of steroid toxicity, which I didn't put down. Right? So what we did with this patient is we readjusted the dose of steroids, gave him an uh, appropriate dose, then put him on a tailing dose of steroids uh, uh, at 40 milligrams per kilogram per meter squared for another four weeks, and then started to tail off. And now this child is in remission. And now for the last eight months, he's been in remission. I'm hoping he reached a 12 month period so that we don't have to use a steroid bearing agent. So it's very important that we follow these recommendations quite carefully and treat patients appropriately. So thank you very much uh, for that. So I hope I, I've now enlightened you on how to manage this condition, which we all think is quite simple, but unfortunately it seems to be a little more complicated than what we think it is. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Abim. It's indeed complicated <laughs> with all these uh, terminologies. Yeah, that, yeah. But I think that was excellent presentation. And I think everyone will agree with me that, you know, you did a great job in preparing this presentation. Yeah, Dr. I just Abim. want to point out that, remember, some of these recommendations may change. Sorry. Some of these recommendations may change on publication because it's sent to other reviewers. And therefore, I did not quote them in my slides, right? But I'm hoping yeah. that very soon it will be published and uh, it will be in the public domain. Okay? All right. Thank you. So there are so many questions, Professor <laughs> yeah, can, can you read them uh, on the chat that box? Fine. Or... I'm sure I can yeah. read them. Yes, yeah. please. Yeah. So my question is the duration of initial treatment, 2 milligrams per, per kilogram until complete remission. Shouldn't this remain within four week period? The answer is yes, okay? The answer is that at the moment, you know, the resident study is not out and even for relapses, et cetera, uh, you should, when in the initial presentation, you should give them two milligrams per kilogram for four weeks. Once they go into remission, then you can change them to uh, 40 milligram per meter squared and reduce the dose of steroids. And either, depending on the group of patients you're treating, you can if you may either stop abruptly or you can tail off the dose. The next, so I hope I've answered that question. Yes, you should treat for four week period. If a client attains complete remission in two weeks period, should I switch to 1.5 milligrams alternate day or should I wait till the complete remission of four weeks? Now, this again, <clears throat> depends on the group of patients you're dealing with. In my practice, when I'm dealing with our local population, even if they are in remission after two weeks, I still maintain them on, a, on, on the full dose of steroids for four weeks. However, in many of the places where they see uh, groups of patients who are likely to be highly steroid sensitive, particularly Caucasian patients or Asian patients, right? then the question is, should you keep them on a high dose of steroids or not? And there's a lot of argument about this. And so the group decided, like I said in the lecture, that once a patient is in remission, you can drop the dose of steroids to 1.5 milligram. But that depends on what group of patients you are dealing with. So if you find that after two weeks, the patient is still in partial remission, you should continue the dose. If the patient is complete remission and you're quite happy that you've measured the albumin has come up, you've, the, the uh, floating creatinine ratio is normal, then yes, you can reduce that dose. But that depends on your local practice. Let's see the next one. Okay. What is the uh, role of other steroids on other steroids on nephrotic syndrome? Is dexamethasone or methylprednisone? Okay, so uh, dexamethasone is cheaper than methylprednisolone. Okay, so in places like India and other places, they're using dexamethasone as an add-on intravenously, as an add-on to, to prednisone. Uh, we still use methylprednisolone. And so the choice is pretty much what you have available. Okay, it doesn't matter. So because methylprednisolone was being used in most units, uh, 
the uh, committee decided to put that as the, the drug of choice. But like I said, you don't have to give that. You can still continue on, on your full dose oral prednisone, but many units feel that to, to decrease the time of the use of prednisone, you give four weeks of high dose prednisone. If they are not in complete remission, you give them three doses of intravenous methylprednisolone. And then if they don't go into remission in the next two weeks, you can diagnose them as steroid resistant. So the answer is you can use both dexamethasone or methylprednisone. For drug toxicity, what are alternative treatments uh, and for how long? Okay, we went into this, right? For drug toxicity, if you find that they are getting steroid toxicity, then you should consider a steroid sparing agents. The one we have available in South Africa readily are the CNIs, either cyclosporin or tacrolimus. We use tacrolimus because of the better safety uh, side effect profile. Uh, you can use cyclophosphamide, which is quite cheap. And if the patient has been treated in one of the regional or district hospitals, I recommend that as a second line because they don't have tacrolimus available very readily. Uh, Mycophenolate morphotil can be used, but as I said, it is quite expensive. And so I only use that under special indication if there's hypertension, compromised kidney function or something like that. So yes, you can use one of those alternate treatments uh, as a steroid spreading agent. Rituximab, as I said, I only use it as rescue treatment, but in Western countries, they are now starting to use it as second line treatment. For children with FSGS, steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome on cyclosporin and low dose, syrup steroids exhibiting drug toxicity, what are the alternatives? Okay, so <clears throat> that depends on low dose, let's see, low dose steroids and cyclosporin, but they're getting drug. So you have to see what the toxicity is due to. Is it due to the cyclosporin or is it due to the steroids or a combination of both, okay? And what the committee said then is if you have toxicity this agent, then you should try and change to an alternative. So you can consider if you don't, in our case, we will use rituximab. But if you don't have rituximab available, you can try um, cyclophosphamide, or, which is cheaper, and or you can try mycophenolate morphotil if it's due to CNIs. If the toxicity is mainly due to steroids, you can stop the steroids and keep them just on the CNI, okay? So that's what you can do to decrease the toxicity profile. Um, the next question is, when using steroids sparing agents, you have to stop prednisone. The answer is no. You don't have to, but the thing is, if you're using tacrolimus, what I do is I keep the prednisone on board for a short while until I get complete remission, and then I stop the, the tail off or stop the steroids. The reason being that if you keep the patients on high-dose steroid and tacrolimus, the chances of getting, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, hyperglycemia are much higher. So many of these patients, and we have one patient, one of our transplant patients who actually presented with diabetic ketoacidosis, who was on not high dose, but moderate doses of prednisone and, and pretty high doses of tacrolimus because he was less than three months in transplant. And that was the first time I ever saw this. So he actually required insulin treatment and control of his diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, we had to stop all immunosuppression for a short while until we got his sugar levels under control and then reintroduced it very gradually so that he doesn't reject. So yeah, that's what you can do, okay? Regarding tapering of steroid dose, what is recommended duration tapering down? Now, like I said, you know, there's no uh, strong study on this. This was a grade C recommendation, but if you are considering tapering it off, I usually taper it off within a period of two to three months, okay? That's what I use. And that's because I'm dealing with a slightly different group of patients compared to what they see in Western countries where the patients are highly steroid sensitive, okay? So that is what I do. And I'm sure you'll be able to have a similar experience in your patients. If the patient developed hyperglycemia during the course of treatment, what is your uh, management approach? Hyperglycemia, I must say, I've treated a lot of nephrotics. I have not seen it so far, except for that transplant page, which wasn't a nephrotic. But uh, if you do encounter it, the most likely offending agent is going to be your steroids. And I would suggest that you tail off the steroids pretty quickly and put the patient onto a steroid bearing agent. Okay. Now, in this case, what I do is I start the patient on the steroid bearing. I would start the patient on a steroid bearing agent. And if they don't go into remission, then uh, I would add a second line, a second agent to it so that I can maintain, attain remission. But I must tell you, I haven't encountered this so far. So 
I'm just telling what I would do in theory rather than what I have really done in practice. So you can do that because the most likely offending agent in that case would be a steroid. After alternate day prednisone, how long should one tail off and how many milligrams? Okay, like I said, that depends on the population. I do it quite gradually in my patients. If they are older children and I'm dealing with uh, one of my uh, black African patients, then I will reduce it by 10 milligrams every two weeks. And usually that gets me down in the period of about two months. So that is how I reduce the steroids. And when I reach the lower part of it, that means I get to 10 milligrams. I then reduce by five milligrams and then half, two and a half milligrams and then stop. And that way I haven't found many of my patients relapsing. But I think you've got to get a feel of your patients to do this. Thing. Once again, the guideline does not dictate exactly how you tell them, but I tell up within that two month period, two to two and a half months. How long can steroid dependent and nephrotic syndromes with frequent relapses stay on steroids? Mm. We discussed this. So if you've got a steroid dependent and you've got in a low dose steroids, provided you have no signs of toxicity, you can keep him on that and then reassess the patient at six months and at 12 months. If by 12 month period, they have no relapses, then according to guidelines, you can consider stopping the steroids. In my setting, I, because of the fact that these patients tend to relapse quite quickly, and I'm doing this purely by experience, not by publication or randomized control trials, I tend to keep them on low dose steroids uh, for a slightly longer period between say 18 to 24 months. And then uh, if they are still maintaining the remission, I stop the steroids provided, and that's the proviso, they have no evidence of steroid toxicity. So you got to monitor sugar levels, you got to monitor the, and do x-rays, you got to check the eyes to make sure they don't have cataracts, you got to check the uh, cardiac function, make sure they don't develop steroid myopathy, uh, cardiomyopathy or anything like that. So because we are able to monitor these patients quite closely and uh, we are able to detect any uh, you know, subtle forms of steroid toxicity, I'm quite confident to keep them on that for at least a period of 18 to 24 months and then consider stopping the treatment. Okay, so that's what was in the chat box, Ijan. I uh, hope I've answered everyone's question. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> thank you. You know, you tried to be precise. Uh, thank yeah. you very much. So, but there is one, another question uh, yeah. sure. uh, from Faustin Magomola asking, would, would like to know about congenital nephrotic syndrome when right. to anticipate and how to manage it. Okay. Would like uh, to know about congenital no, okay. nephrotic syndrome yeah. Uh, sorry, I can't. When see that. to yeah. anticipate and how to manage it? Oh, okay. Okay, reading from the questions here. Oh, sorry, I didn't see the Queen anything. Okay, uh, when uh, would like to know about congenital nephrotic syndrome? When to anticipate? Okay, so the definition of congenital nephrotic syndrome, I think I did that in the last lecture, is any child who developed nephrotic syndrome starting from birth to the first three months. Okay, so that's the period that you diagnose congenital nephrotic. If you diagnose nephrotic syndrome after three months of age, up to a year of age, that's infantile nephrotic syndrome. If you diagnose nephrotic syndrome on one year of age, up to 10 years of age, that is classical nephrotic syndrome. After that, it is late onset nephrotic syndrome. So that's the classification of nephrotic syndrome based on age criteria, okay? Now, why is it important to know is because it has impacts on management. Congenital nephrotics, to date have a very large, uh, very high incidence of genetic mutations. And we've shown in our congenital nephrotics that in about 20%, they have some form of genetic mutation, okay? Now, the commonest one there is the NPHS1 gene, which is a finished type of nephrotic syndrome. These patients do not respond to steroids or any other immunosuppressive agents, okay? And what is different in these patients is that when we diagnose nephrotic syndrome, one of the things that we look for is besides the high protein loss and the fact that they have hypoalbuminemia, you raise cholesterol, okay? Because that's an accompaniment of the nephrotic syndrome. And the thing is these patients usually have uh, cholesterol sometimes with pretty much in the normal rate. So they are a group of patients who are difficult to differentiate between severe acute malnutrition and uh, nephrotic syndrome, but the degree of protein urea usually gives it away. So yeah, if you see a severe acute malnutrition with edema, we used to call it miasmic previous day, right? Or, or miasmic edema, uh, quash. Uh, 
So if you see that group of patients in the first three months of life and you have a, you start them on a proper diet and they are not responding, you do a protein uh, creatinine ratio and it's high, then you must suspect congenital nephrotic syndrome. Uh, how do you manage them? We don't manage them in the usual way of giving them steroids or anything. Of course, we biopsy all these patients because we don't have genetic testing readily available to us, depending on what pathology we find. But immunosuppression doesn't work, so we only treat them with RAS inhibition. And if we are failing to control that, together with albumin and uh, diuretic infusions, if we fail to control the edema and the patient is relapsing very often or is not responding, then we will add a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug to actually drop the GFR, besides using RAS. And we bump the RAS up to maximum, okay? So we use quite high doses of, of uh, of uh, RAS inhibitors in these patients. So that's how we manage them, okay? Failing of that, if we still don't get control of edema, then we aim for a unilateral nephrectomy, okay? And that's been shown because of the fact that you remove one kidney. Remember, many of these, all these patients, if they are severe in that phase group, are subsequently going to go into kidney failure. And the managed, correct management is that if you're in a good unit, you do bilateral nephrectomies, you put the patient dialysis to, and you put in a peg to make sure you feed them adequately. And once they reach an appropriate size, that means over 10 kilograms, you can transplant the patient. Okay, that is what they, my friend uh, Pierre Crochet does in his unit. I am not so lucky. So what I do is I manage them with RAS and NSAIDs. If, however, I am not winning, I do a unilateral nephrectomy. If I'm still not winning, then unfortunately I have to do bilateral nephrectomies and put them onto dialysis, right? But the mainstay of management of these patients, unfortunately, is transplantation. Uh, can you recommend less potent steroid like hydrocortisone tablets for treatment of trotic syndrome to minimize prednisone side effects? Hmm. I'll be honest with you, I've never considered that. I've never seen that anywhere and I have no literature to that effect. Uh, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to answer that question because I don't have any experience. I've never seen hydrocortisone used for this patient. What I've seen is ACTH being used and um, uh, there are some reports that say the patients have responded even in the resistant form, but uh, based on the literature search and the recommendations by the committee, this is not a drug that we should be considering using in this group of patients. So Yes, Dr. Mozi, I don't have an answer for you because I've never encountered hydrocortisone used for nephrotics. Uh, Dr. Lucas said, is there room for diuretics for children with nephrotic syndrome? Yeah, there's definitely, diuretics don't treat nephrotic syndrome. Diuretics treat the symptom, okay? They just they get rid of the excess of edema, etc. So I use diuretics in the child who's not very uh, severely uh, edematous and uh, they work. Uh, it makes the mother happy because she sees the edema getting lost. So she's very happy she thinks that's one wonder drug, but it, it's not treating the product. They continue to lose protein. And you shouldn't be overzealous in your use of diuretics because then you're going to precipitate pre renal failure in these patients. Okay, so just be very careful. Okay, so yeah, there's definitely a place. And especially if I'm using albumin infusions, I use ferrosamide because of the fact that you're giving a large volume to these patients with a high osmotic pressure. And if you don't give them furosemide, you can push them into pulmonary edema. Remember, your albumin infusions must be given very slowly, okay? Not over one to two hours. I usually give it over six hours. And I tell them, I do a sandwich technique. I give them one milligram per kilogram Lasix or furosemide halfway through the infusion and at the end of the infusion. So in that way, I ensure that they are being diuretic adequate. Remember, these patients have normal kidney function, so they should respond to furosemide. So yeah, there's a place for that, okay? Okay, and then Dr. Magomola wanted to know, in immunocompromised patients in a product system, treatment regimen is still the same. Yeah, it is pretty much the same. Um, in our patients who have that depends now whether you're talking about idiopathic nephrotic syndrome or you're talking about nephrotic syndrome due to some other cause. Now remember, if you have immunocompromised patients due to say HIV nephropathy, I do not use steroids in these patients, okay? Some of the literature says that you can use it for a short course and they've been shown to be quite useful. And there was one or two publications that said that if you add cyclosporin, that it has some effect on suppressing the HIV uh, viral load, et cetera. 
I have no experience with that and I am not brave enough to use those kind of things. So in my HIV positive nephropic uh, positive patients who have nephropathy from that uh, high vans, I don't use steroids in these patients because they don't respond, okay? And the problem with using steroids is you further immunosuppressive patients and they get overwhelming infections, particularly fungal infections, and the patients can demise from that. So the answer is no, I don't use it. Lupus patients, etc., of course, treat on their own merit. Sorry, uh, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I was saying, uh, I think you have tried to answer almost all the yeah. questions, Dr. Yeah. Professor Bima. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Nice. Thank you very much. So um, uh, I think uh, we have come to an end of our today's presentation. Yeah. Sorry about the long time. <laughs> no, yeah. yeah, no, no, no. That you manage it very, very well. And uh, we are happy that you've been able to answer uh, all the questions. So we really appreciate it, uh, Professor Bima. Oh, and okay. thank you for your time. Uh, yeah. As usual, as always, you have been very supportive okay. and sharing I your find, I, to share I, I, I find these chats very useful because I can get to ask <laughs> questions. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Again. All the thank best. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone with. Uh, Dr. Lloyd, do you have any questions no, or no anyone question. from the panel? It is so exhaustively covered. It's yeah. beautiful. The definitions are wonderful. <laughs> the treatment modalities are open so, so very meticulously. And I, I think uh, I must say, uh, yeah. I must say, the committee was quite exhaustive. You know, sitting yeah. at a committee all the time, I mean, I exhausted myself. <laughs> yeah. See? Must be three, four days of full time work from morning to night. Mm, no, we did it over weeks. It over took weeks. us about six, yeah, about eight months. Okay. Thank you for the slides. Yeah. Uh, I have already. Oh, you are come. Yes. Slides. It's already yeah. gone across okay. the board. I think. Uh, okay. All right. Board. Thanks a lot.